being a first generation black female at a PWI. Um, wow. That is loaded, I tell you. <laughs> hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm looking real chill and basic, and I'm not gonna apologize for that. This was week one of my uh, candidacy exam, which you'll hear more about that later. But basically, today has just been a work day, trying to finish up my goals for week one and all the things that I plan to do before I start um, really writing next week. And I wanted to get this video done for you guys. So many people have reached out on Instagram and on YouTube to let me know um, that they are looking forward to me talking about PhD. I talk to you guys a little bit here and there, but people have questions about PhD life. And so I am here today to answer just some of the questions that have come up in my DMs. Um, in my uh, email, some people have emailed me some questions and just in conversation what people generally ask me about my PhD, I just kind of combined them all into like a grab bag. And I'm hoping my answers to these questions will help those of you who like have heard of PhD or getting a doctorate degree but you have no idea what that entails or what that looks like. Um, I hope my journey of being clueless about it and figuring it out will help and encourage some of you. So if you just stumbled across this video and you have no idea who I am, my name is Gabrielle, I also go by Gabe. Um, or Miss GCH here on my channel and um, I am a third year actually moving into my fourth year um, of my PhD program at The Ohio State University I am studying school psychology and I have a master's degree in school psychology and a master's of education and um, I have a BA in uh, psychology and a bachelor's of science in applied health science focusing on human development and family studies um, so that's just a little bit about my background and kind of what qualifies me to talk about what I'm going to talk about today. But the most unique part about it all is that I am a first generation PhD student. And so that title in itself comes with so much. Um, I'm really forging my own path as far as, you know, not really having family members uh, that have gone before me to do that. And so this is a pretty big deal for not only me, but for my village, for my family. So I would give you a whole spiel about my background, but I'm just going to jump right into the questions because I think I'll be able to answer everything with the questions that I have before me. Um, so yeah, here we go. So I did, I um, graduated high school from Firestone High School in Akron, Ohio. Uh, I graduated there in 2012. I went straight into Indiana University in that fall and uh, graduated May 2016, so exactly four years. And that's when I got that BA and BS. And then I moved straight into my master's program at Loyola University Chicago. And it was a year long master's program. Um, so I got my master's in August of 2017. And then transferred August of 2017 to Ohio State. And I was transferring actually to finish out the EDS degree. I feel like I've talked about this more than once on my channel, but sorry if it's a repeat for some of y'all. We got some new people I'm sure watching this. So um, I transferred there to finish my my EDS, my education specialist degree, which would allow me to get my license and go practice as a school psychologist. Um, but while finishing those extra two years that I needed for the EDS, that's when my advisors and other people really talked me into staying and doing the PhD program. PhD and EDS are the same for the first two years and then the third year EDS goes out on internship. Uh, so that they can graduate and go practice and then PhD continues on with classwork and other things um, So yeah, that second year I was like, I think I'm gonna do it So I moved over to the PhD track and basically just extended my time um, In grad school. So yeah grad school is a total of five years. I did four years of undergrad So when I graduate with my doctorate in May of 2021, I will have nine years of college under my belt um and that's nine tacked on to uh, the 12 or 13 that I did, you know, of K through 12. I feel like it's a case by case basis. I feel like it'll get touchy if I sit here and try to say like yes or no. Um, for some people, they would say that they wish they wouldn't have taken breaks in between because it, they kind of got out of the swing of school and it was much harder to get back in. It was harder to start studying again for the GRE and um, or you know find their scores from when they took it years ago. Like so, I guess there are some pros and cons there. Um, Honestly, this will probably be its own video, but uh, for me, I'm not gonna lie and say it was easy. I'm not gonna lie and say like, you know, I didn't regret it at some point. Um, 
financially it is very difficult um college students don't make a whole lot of money um there's very few probably that make a really really good amount of money but for me um and most college students it's very hard to make um you know the kind of money that you see like the people that you graduated with making they have careers they're buying houses you know they're buying cars outright and then like just doing a lot of things that um, are not impossible as a college student but are much harder to do so yeah sometimes I think like could I have stacked up money at different points could I have gone especially in the field of education a lot of experience is needed in various ways so I don't know at some point I was kind of thinking like should I have taken a break and work between um, undergrad and grad school uh, I don't know again it's a case-by-case -case basis it is very hard I definitely get burnt out some days like writing papers <sighs> my gosh my gosh and it's just like <laughs> but what no I'm just kidding um so yeah burnout is real um I'm probably gonna do a separate video on how I survive burnout because that's just I have so much to say about that and I want to get to the rest of these questions grad school is specific so if you're not sure what you want to do do not go to grad school you know what I'm saying like grad school is not the place to figure out oh what I what do I want to do you want to do that outside of grad school because unlike undergrad you don't have those um gen eds and things like that to like take your time to figure things out no like if you go in for a school psych program you're coming out as a school psychologist if you go to grad school for a school counseling program you're coming out as a school counselor you know what I'm saying like it's very specific for the most part as far as the break between high school and college I, I don't know if I would recommend that honestly I just don't see the purpose and I feel like college just molded me matured me um, it was the perfect like stepping stone and pathway from high school into like adult world so yeah I, I I don't know if I would recommend a break between high school and college if you know you want to go to college unless there's other circumstances that keep you away from that I would say go ahead and start applying and go to college at max I would take a year off if you feel like you really need time you know to focus on applications and things like that I think that's fine but yeah I don't know if I would recommend that as much as if you want to take a break between undergrad um, and grad school I could see that being a little bit more feasible So again, PhD was kind of like introduced to me and then I slowly became comfortable with it. I didn't actually go out and pursue a PhD program. Like when I applied for grad school, I was applying as an EDS student, an ed specialist student. I was not applying for a PhD program. Um, so my path is a little bit different than most. Um, but the reason that I decided to, like what kind of steal it from me as far as like, I need to go get this PhD is that um, I transferred into Ohio State. So I only had one year under my belt and then that third year would have been a full-time internship. Um, out in Columbus so I would not have been able to really get integrated into um, you know Ohio State into Columbus City Schools and like a lot of the things that we were doing the projects we were doing like I feel like I needed more time to really soak up all that Ohio State and their program had to offer I could have probably gone on to internship and been perfectly fine but I saw value in sticking it out here staying here um, having more time to uh, delve into research to get into projects to interact with departments on campus to really maximize all that I could uh, get out of this program and out of Ohio State and that to me has been the biggest benefit of all I've had opportunities to fly out places to go to conferences to uh, be a part of projects to meet really higher ups on campus to form partnerships with uh, community schools um, just do a whole lot more that I would not have been able to do this year because this year I would have been out on internship if I had stayed an EDS student. So um, that was the main thing for me. And when we're talking about doing what I want, so my vision um, is definitely to be a practitioner. Um, so a lot of the times people are like, you want to be a practitioner, why are you getting a PhD? Well, yeah. Um, like I said, for that experience piece, that you get so much more, you get so much deeper into the field of education and school psychology 
when you are here for more time um, and just the way the PhD program is set up I'm getting tons more experience than I would get as just an EDS student um, so that's one reason the other reason is like I said my vision is to be a practitioner but then to uh, move into kind of an administrative role I've always been very systems level um, thinking when it comes to education I want to impact systems so really to impact systems the way that I want to yes getting a PhD is something that I want to do. To be a school psychologist, no, I don't have to get a PhD. Like I've said a lot of times, getting that EDS degree and taking the license exam and getting your license to practice is enough. Like you can go work in schools, you can work in private practice, you can open your own private practice, but you can work under someone supervised in a private practice setting. So you really don't need a PhD to be a school psychologist. I guess I kind of answered that already, that I'm not going straight into academia. I'm not, I may not go into academia at all. Um, so there's definitely different ways to use a PhD. Again, not really sure how true that is for every program, but it is possible to use it for other things. A lot of times too, let's be honest, it, it's a respect thing, it's a politics thing of people value, you know, when you've done a dissertation, when you've gone through this extra schooling, so it gives you opportunities that may not be available to people who don't um, choose to take this route. And that's just the honest truth. Let's just be real about it. And don't let anyone tell you you have to go into academia. You can forge your own path. You can do what you wanna do with a PhD. Don't let anybody tell you what you have to do with it. Being a first generation PhD student is, is a lot of things. <laughs> especially a first generation uh, black woman. So one is that I questioned everything. Like I still learn things about getting a PhD that I'm like, I didn't even know that. Like, uh, you know, I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know that was part of the PhD process, you know? Um, I totally pretended like I understood words that I did not know. Like when I was starting, a lot of people would talk about the dissertation or they would say words like ABD and I'm like, what is ABD? Or the difference between a doctoral student and a doctoral candidate, candidacy or competency exams. Like all of these words that I was like, what? Defense. I'm like, hey, hey, what is this? Like, what are y'all talking about? Um, I knew a dissertation because people just always say that word, but I didn't know like, what is a dissertation? You know, like what goes into the process? I did not know. So I kind of was learning as I went. I would read our handbook for our program and ask a bunch of questions. And then some stuff you just pick up being around PhD students. You figure out what they're talking about. You know what I'm saying? And then you nod along and pretend you knew all along. The other component of it that's really unique is that pretty much nobody understands what I'm doing back home. <laughs> like, as much as they try and probably want to come off as if they know what I do, most times if you ask them, they have no idea what I'm doing. They just know I'm still in school. They do know I'm becoming a doctor. They can remember that much. Um, but they don't really understand the process. And so sometimes, um, you know, that that sucks a little bit, you know, that you're doing this thing that nobody really understands, they're rooting for you, but it's kind of like, uh, we don't really get it, but like kudos to you. Um, so sometimes it can be a little lonely, especially when you're doing it away from your hometown. So everyone is moving on with their lives, having kids, getting married, and you're still in school doing this thing that everybody kind of thinks you're crazy for doing. You know, so that part of being first generation is difficult. Um, you're just kind of forging this path that, you know, not a lot of people have really walked on. So that's interesting. So another part of it is like, as with college in general, when you're first generation, you don't have people who necessarily know exactly what to do to get you where you wanna go. But a really good thing that's a mediator for that is the network that you build for yourself in undergrad. So for example, I built a pretty strong network of people from all different fields, many who had their doctorate or were pursuing their doctorate that could answer my question. Make sure you have those people's numbers and their email addresses so that they can look over your application and look over your personal statement and like know what to look out for. You know, in our very capitalist competition society, a lot of times nobody's telling you, hey, this is it, one plus one equals two, two plus two equals four, these are the steps, boom. No one's really handing you that. You have to go and search for that. And so you want a community of people around you who will show you, uh-uh, don't say it like that, that might turn, you know, these people 
off, you know, do this, do it like this, word it like this, format it like this. Um, that's exactly the kind of network that you want in order to get where you want to go. Being a first generation black female at a PWI, um, wow. That is loaded, I tell you. <laughs> that is loaded. I actually did a qualitative uh, study for my qualitative research class in the spring, interviewing black women pursuing a PhD at a PWI because my isn't an experience. Um, and I would say that the main thing that I deal with that I probably that probably wasn't on my radar before this was is imposter syndrome. Holy moly, it is like screaming. And like with any predominantly white space, you're gonna deal with microaggressions. Like, just gear yourself up and get ready for it. I'm not saying roll over and just pretend like you don't experience them, but prepare for that to be a part of your story. Um, I've been blessed and I mean blessed because even though I'm at a PWI, three out of four of my faculty are black. Um, which is unheard of on a PWI campus. The dean of our college is black. Um, he actually was just hired, I think, this past year. Um, we have a lot of black leadership in my space. So even though Ohio State in, in total, that's not everybody's story. A lot of people, especially like in the med school and stuff, are in predominantly white spaces and it's very challenging. They have a lot of barriers to overcome. Um, across the board, I have been blessed. So that's not to say that I haven't dealt with any barriers or any issues at all, but a lot of that has been mediated because my advisors, my mentors, like the people who are really looking out for me are all black. And that's not even to say that you have to have black people in these positions looking out for you in order for you to get where you need to go. Absolutely not. I know a lot, a lot of faculty from all backgrounds who have been amazing um, allies for black students especially black women pursuing their PhDs. Um, but yeah, it is a journey. It is not easy. Um, the main thing that I recommend to people all the time is finding your community and all the women that I talk to that are in my same position all say the same thing. Like having a community is what gets you through. This is hard for me to answer because part of me is like, mm, college funding is a scam. You know, like, it's America. It's a scam. Like, do they really need all these thousands and thousands and thousands, and I mean thousands, like hundred thousands of dollars for us to get our education? I absolutely do not believe that. From that perspective, let me just be clear, no. Like, no, college should not be as expensive as it is. I feel like there is still value there. Um, I feel like, you know, college is hit or miss as it is. Like there are professors who use the same syllabus and barely update it every uh, new semester and do a half whack job, you know. Like you're gonna have amazing professors that change your life. You're gonna have sucky professors that you're like, why, are, how do you still have a job? But I don't take back any of the experience, the networking, the opportunities that I've been able to get throughout my college years. Like truly, it's unmatched. All of my opportunities literally fit like puzzle pieces. It was like a yellow brick road, literally. That was just like one thing led to another, stuff I didn't even know about when I first started. Like I never, when I started, I never thought I would be here where I am now. But kind of one thing just led to another, led to another. Um, and I think that investment has been worth it. Some people get in programs where they end up paying all that money and they have a horrible experience and they would say, no, it wasn't worth it. They didn't get the experience they wanted. They didn't get the knowledge that they wanted. And we'll see if it's really worth the investment depending on what kind of job I get when I'm done. Hey -o. <laughs> a lot of the intricate little stuff can be different across the board. So I would just speak for uh, school spike and specifically my program. So again, five years. First year you get that master's degree. The second year you do practicum. Um, so I was in the schools two days a week. I think our uh, hours requirement was like 400 hours for the year, something like that. So that's your second year practicum. That's your most involved practicum. Um, and you're taking classes with that. The third year you're taking, still taking classes and you're doing advanced practicum. Um, so that's where in the school you're doing um, counseling, you're doing interventions and things like that. After the third year typically is when people um, do the candidacy or competency exams. But for us that's 10 weeks of writing, four different research questions. 
um, which you get from your four committee members. You choose your committee members, so that's really awesome. Each one ends up being about 25 pages. You're writing basically a mini dissertation. So we did the written, we submit that at the end of the 10 weeks, and then around August or September, we orally defend. So that bit, that's basically we are in a room with our committee, they ask us questions about our research, about things that we included. If I pass that oral defense, then I come out as a PhD candidate um, or a doctoral candidate. Um, so up until then, I was a doctoral student. If I pass the competency exams or candidacy exams, I will then be a doctoral candidate. Um, from there, you have the fourth year where typically you would not be taking classes unless you have classes left over that you need to take. I have one more class to take, uh, but I don't have a full course load anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! So we do that, and then um, we're advanced practicum. Again, we do another year of advanced practice. So we're in the schools doing interventions and counseling, but we're also supervising uh, students from across the three years. Also during that fourth year, you're doing your dissertation proposal, you're writing your dissertation, collecting your data, um, finishing your dissertation. If you're a real G, that's what I'm trying to be. Finishing the dissertation and defending hopefully before my fifth year internship. That is my goal. I don't know about the rest of the world. But if I can do it, I'm gonna do it. Amen. Because I'm not trying to be stressed out with a dissertation during the fifth year. The fifth year is a full-time internship. I am here on the journey and we say thank you Jesus. We are, we only got this much left. We say thank you Jesus. So yeah, and most programs I know, like a lot of my friends, they all have competency exams or candidacy exams. The wording changes sometimes. Um, all move from doctoral student to doctoral candidate to dissertation proposal, dissertation. Like The dissertation typically, I don't know a PhD program where you wouldn't have to write a dissertation. Like that's literally the whole point of a PhD is writing this dissertation, contributing to research in your field um, formally. God has been a part of this in every single step y'all. And I'm gonna tell y'all twofold what the real is. Cause I'm gonna keep it real with y'all. I'm not, I'm not gonna sugarcoat anything. I, I truly believe that I incorporated God in every step. So I was open to the opportunities and the doors that he would open. The ones that he closed, I let them close. I did not argue with. I had my community praying during every transition. So when I was transitioning from, from undergrad to grad school, I was having people pray, Lord, let me be making the right decision. Let me be doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, etc." Um, and I've talked to you all about my testimony. If you haven't seen that already you got to go watch that it really has a lot to do with my PhD experience um but I kind of had a hiccup from undergrad to grad and making that decision to go to Chicago I don't regret it at all because like you'll see the testimony it was the best decision of my life and God perfectly directed me back where I was supposed to be um but I was open I was open to his voice I was open to when he uh hit me in the face in Chicago and said this is not where you're supposed to be and I tried to tell you that before and you didn't want to listen to me you know and I, I was open and willing to take risks um oh my gosh I've taken so many risks that are just like it's crazy it makes no sense but I was totally banking on like okay this is what God uh is saying and I'm, I'm going with it and I would do those things and literally every time God was faithful opportunities would come out the blue like he just when you yield to him and let him be the captain of what you want to do instead of trying to do it yourself I'm telling you it's, it's a winner every time so I have all of this to credit to God I tell people I feel like God has been orchestrating that's the best way I can describe it what I was saying about like being 100% real with y'all is that a lot of times if my schedule will get super crazy or I'm super stressed out I would know it's because I'm not spending enough time with God, not leaning into Him um, and allowing His peace to overcome me. I was trying to do stuff in my own power. Literally every time I get super stressed out, it's like, girl, have you been in your word? Have you been praying? Have you been um, filling your house with the word of God? So, you know, YouTube, I love listening to Pastor John Gray, Pastor Stephen Furtick, um, Pastor Michael Todd, like having their messages going um, out loud in my house or having worship music on uh, in the mornings when I'm in the shower or while I'm doing something like just setting the atmosphere I would realize like I 
Like, girl, you put God on the back burner and how dare you? After all he's orchestrated and done for you to be where you are, how dare you put him on the back burner? Like, that will check me sometimes. And I'm just being 100% real. It is so easy, just like it is in it, with no matter what you're doing, PhD, career, whatever, to get so consumed in what you're doing that God ends up on the back burner. So it's all about recalibrating. It's all about refocusing if you get off the path. Um, but yeah, those are just simple ways that I incorporate God into my day, into my time. There's so many ways to incorporate him in this journey. Um, and people often talk about like, how is it being a believer um, in a secular uh, field or you know, at a liberal arts school. And I just definitely think I'm gonna do a whole separate video on that because I am sure I have talked over my limit for this video. I know I have, cause I just, I have multiple clips that are long. And so I hope I answered all your questions. If not, I am definitely open for more questions in the comment section. Feel free to drop them down there. Or as always, my DMs are open and available to you. There will be more content since so many people have been asking me to make PhD content. So don't you worry, there will be more content coming out. Y'all pray my strength in the Lord for my, this is wrapping up my first week of candidacy. So y'all just keep me in your prayers. And uh, yeah, that's all I have for you guys subscribe if you really enjoyed this if you're looking forward to the new content make sure you hit the notification bell so that you don't miss it you'll be notified every time I drop a video uh, if you like this I would love for you to like it and share with me something in the comments that you learned or tell me your story what you're thinking about PhD I'd love to help you in any way that I can and yeah so with all that said I will catch you guys in my next video bye